Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure if this is a good slot or a bad slot, because you'll all be waiting to hear which of those amazing teachers is going to win uh, the award. Uh, but the upside for me, of course, is that uh, that'll hold the tension, and you'll be thinking, when's he going to finish? And you'll, uh, <clears throat> you'll keep paying attention to my face to see if I'm about to wrap up. Um, before I start, I should like to thank uh, TGELF, uh, the foundation for its generosity uh, in inviting me here to speak to you. It's an honor uh, that the foundation has asked me to speak this evening. And it's also a privilege to be addressing such uh, a gathering of capable, uh, competent, uh, and highly able people as, as yourselves. Um, I have to say that uh, I'd, on behalf of myself, and I'm sure many others, I'd like to thank uh, the, the dream teachers who spoke this afternoon and again uh, this evening uh, to us. Um, I was very humbled by the fact that they were um, doing s such extraordinary work in, in so many different uh, sets of circumstances. There was a slightly terrifying absence of men. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. <clears throat> and um, I thought to myself, T. Galf is ethical. Uh, so therefore, it won't have stacked the odds <laughs> against the men. And then I thought, well, perhaps the men are sitting in offices somewhere in plotting new ways uh, to make the lives of these teachers even more miserable than they are at the moment <laughs> with respect to the curriculum, with respect to examinations, tests, and all of the paperwork. And, um, you know, it, uh, I suddenly thought, yes, uh, the division of labor is, is very bad. And uh, we need to get some of these uh, amazing I idealists and uh, educational philosophers into the driving seat and some of us men uh, out of the way. Um, so uh, th thank you very much to all of them for, for being so, so inspiring. Uh, and uh, it took me back to my days as a, as a teacher in the, in the classroom. And uh, sometimes I think being an administrator or a policymaker um, is not where the real fun and the real satisfaction is. I've named my talk this evening, it's a working title, We Are All Flatlanders Now. And I mean that very broadly and very generally and not, not literally. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by flatlanders a little later. Or uh, another working title, perhaps a working subtitle, is The Strange Death of Thinking. If you look at what we have here in the front and up on these screens, um, we're asking an awful lot of our younger generation, leadership, ethics, and altruism. We're asking them, uh, these young people here this evening, to come up with some inventive to solutions to the sort of uh, messes that we have made, um, my generation and uh, perhaps a generation in between. So we're handing them a mighty mess and then saying, lead us out of this with altruism and very high ethical standards. <clears throat> and of course, politicians recently, policymakers have been hitting new lows. I'm thinking of Anthony Weiner in uh, the United States, a congressman who's thrown out uh, for some <laughs> terrible behavior, which he then repeats. And you think, what was he thinking of I, you know, once, twice? Uh, and he's still brazenly running for uh, the mayor of New York. And I think of some of our own politicians who wrote a letter uh, to President Obama, and then, like some of the youngest and worst schoolboys I've ever come across, said, I didn't do nothing. It, it, it wasn't me. Um, that's not my name on there. I didn't sign that. It's a cut-and-paste job. And there's a forensic scientist in California who says, that's you. That's your ink, you signed it. And they're still saying, um, I didn't do nothing, which is a double negative, so we've got them there. <clears throat> so um, what uh, this conference is about is, uh, it's really a celebration of vision and idealism. Um, but it is very easy for idealism to drift into sentimentality uh, if we're not careful. And what I'm going to do tonight is, I hope, not, not upset too many people. Uh, but I think we do have to have a long, hard look at what we're asking of the, the younger generations and what we're actually doing to them uh, to equip them for what we are asking them to do. 
And there's a strange paradox loose in the world today. The more we know, uh, the less we seem to understand. So we know more about the oceans than any generations in human history on one level. We have this massive amount of data. Uh, so our response to that is to poison them in an accelerated fashion and kill hundreds of millions of sharks a year and start to destroy the biodiversity of the oceans as well as poisoning them and so on and so forth. Um, we seem to behave less and less in alignment uh, with the knowledge of which we're all so proud, this knowledge we've accumulated over 300,000 years of evolution. And we keep asking the question, how did this happen? How did it all happen? Uh, it seems to be on everyone's lips. 2008, the financial crisis, ecological disasters, political disasters, civil wars. And one of our judges this afternoon was quite rightly um, commented that uh, I found one of the teachers um, more, well, I would have liked more of the teacher and less of the film that the young people had made because it seemed very pessimistic and the teacher was very optimistic. But actually that's, that's how many young people see the future which we have handed uh, to them. The more workshops we hold, the more conferences we hold on ethical leadership, the worse the ethics of our leaders, most of them old, but some of them young as well, uh, seem to become. So we're living in a paradoxical uh, situation. Um, the more we know, the less we understand. <clears throat> and all of those of us who want a better world, which is why we're here, we're gathered here, and are driven by idealism, some vision of the future, not necessarily utopian, but certainly better than where we are today. Um, we, we have a mortal enemy, and that is destroying the dreams of our dream teachers uh, if we're not careful. I'm a, an historian by profession, as our very kind uh, introducer uh, said earlier on. And I, as a result of my career in education and the exercise of my profession as an historian, um, I see two huge and growing human deficits. Uh, one is foresight. If you can find people with foresight, hire them immediately. They are in rare supply. And also what I call joined up thinking, the ability to bring together a whole series of different strands and avoid the law of unintended consequences. F. Scott Fitzgerald said that intelligence is defined by the ability to hold two apparently contradictory ideas uh, in your head at the same time. Um, that's not a recipe for confusion because intelligence allows you to clarify the tensions and develop the synergies. Um, but I see intelligence as a multi-dimensional um, thing, not just about two contradictory ideas. Um, I, I think we need to perceive thinking in terms of multiple uh, dimensions. There, we've been uh, alluding to various movies uh, in the course of this conference, and there's a wonderful moment in that Star Trek film. For those of you who don't follow Star Trek, it's the people who boldly went where no humans had gone before into the outer reaches of uh, the universe, and they came across all sorts of dangers. And, and in one of the films, um, there's a scene where, in the film, The Wrath of Khan, where Captain Kirk, who runs the Starship Enterprise, um, is exercised and points to the lethality and the danger implicit in Khan. And we, again, we heard this afternoon that, uh, that name repeatedly. And um, he's going to destroy them all. And Mr. Spock, who is the paradigm of logic, says, yes, he is lethal and dangerous, Captain, but he's thinking in two dimensions. And Captain Kirk has a moment of insight, a creative insight, and realizes he's going to take him and begins a three-dimensional maneuver. And my feeling is that we are being driven into that sort of dangerous but two-dimensional thinking uh, in the present age. And the question I have, which was running through my head as I listen to our dream teachers and as I go about my business as an administrator of a very fine school, is are we giving the education to these young people that they need to do all that we're asking of them and all we're presenting uh, them with? We do need great teachers, and we've seen them here this evening, 
and there are millions of them out there in the world. But we also need a great curriculum for those teachers to deliver, and that's where we're found wanting. If you look at Bloom's famous taxonomy, uh, which classifies learning objectives, uh, revised in the, at the beginning of the 21st century, um, at the bottom of the scale, we all need it, at the bottom of the hierarchy is remembering uh, knowledge. They used to call it knowledge, but actually what Bloom and his panel meant was remembering stuff. You need to do that. And then the next one was understanding. The next one was application. The next one was analy analyzing. The next one was evaluation. And then at the top, creating. And we educators, administrators, and policy makers, for the most part around the world, are trapping our students in the first two at best, and probably, as we heard this afternoon from so many of our um, presenters, we're trapping them in the first one at, at worst. And so therefore, we're trapping them in a sort of two-dimensional world where they cannot do all this creation we're asking them to do, because in the classroom, we're not equipping them to do so. We have all sorts of gimmicks. We have all sorts of ideas and innovations. But I think we are reaching a level of intellectual bankruptcy in the way in which we assess our students and drive virtually everything they do in the light of that. And one of the great tragedies of the educational landscape I see around me is that so much of what is good and true and is needed is happening outside our classrooms and that the administrators and policy makers are heaping coals of fire on teachers inside the classroom and making what's happening outside even more difficult and even being seen as irrelevant. I interview science PhDs for jobs who come from the University of Cut and Paste. They have PhDs in their subjects, and they cannot even deal with the simplest application uh, of their knowledge to the sort of questions that the boys in my school are full of. My boys are absolutely bursting with questions. Can they find people to answer them? I'm not really sure. And so our obsession with attainment as an end in itself has reached its destructive zenith. That sounds pretty apocalyptic, but I think if you looked at the film produced by the Sri Ram School Aravali, the children there, that was pretty apocalyptic. Um, there was just about every apocalyptic scene of the last uh, decade thrown in there. And at the end of it all, if we trap our children uh, at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, or whatever taxonomy you, you prefer, um, we are in big trouble. And we have created this topper culture across the globe, it's not just in India, it's every, everywhere else, where we celebrate the topper. We complain about celebrity culture in schools and in education, and then we create our own little celebrities and put them on thrones and say, this is how you should be. So we're driven um, by this uh, blind attempt to get everyone onto the summit of a percentage or whatever the grading system is. And we talk about knowledge economies in the 21st century. But this is nonsense. Since the dawn of time, all economies have been knowledge economies. You couldn't survive if you didn't know stuff. Um, our hunter-gatherer ancestors knew an enormous amount. They had to, because if you were going to hunt, you had to know where the stars were, you had to know what the wind direction was, you had to know an enormous amount. And we evolved from that uh, knowledge economy. And it may have become a bit more complicated. Uh, what we really mean are creativity and innovation economies. So if you look at how we're examining and testing, and even at university level, and even at some of the elite universities of the world, how can people create when they haven't got all of the intermediate steps uh, to build on? And teachers all over the world are teaching to the test. Socrates taught to the test. It was just an amazing test. <laughs> um, all teachers everywhere have taught to the test. But if you compare something where you mug up a textbook 
uh, and you compare that with an assessment regime where you have to do an awful lot of reading and thinking and you're evaluated in a sophisticated way, you can see the point I'm trying to make. And one of my science toppers made this point to me in his exit interview from the Dune School because he said to me, sir, it's really weird. He said, we study these big fat textbooks for two years and they are colossal. 1,500 pages of tiny text. It's a heroic effort just to carry these things, never mind memorize them. And he said, it's really weird. At the end of two years, we know everything in that book and understand nothing. I couldn't have put it more succinctly myself. Know everything, understand nothing. Um, needless to say, he was a science topper and we celebrated him as a, as a great scientist. <clears throat> but he hasn't even gone on to the second step of Bloom's taxonomy. So all across the world, I would opine, we are flat landers now. We have done this to our children, and they are becoming creative, ethical, they're becoming leaders, they're becoming altruistic in spite of what we're doing in the classroom, not because of it. <clears throat> and that's a tragedy, yes, let them go into clubs and societies and so on, but why not make the classroom the place it should be? The term flatland comes from uh, someone who wrote a novella in 1884, someone called Edwin E. Abbott. He was a minister of religion, a headmaster, one for the headmasters, and he was a gifted mathematician. And he wrote in 1884 uh, a short novel called Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. And it starts off in a two-dimensional world where the inhabitants cannot imagine other dimensions. And the way for you to imagine it is take a piece of paper, draw a square on it, and put a dot in the middle. And that represents a wall, and it represents the human being who's a flatlander. And that flatlander lives in a completely flat world and therefore cannot see a way out because there is no way out. You and I, coming from a three-dimensional world, would look in and say, well, you just step, just step out. But a flatlander can only imagine within that confined space, cannot see beyond that. And we come along, and if I put my finger through into flatland, all they would see was a disc cut through my finger. Or if I stepped into it, they would just see a flat disc cut through me. It would have no height, it would just have two dimensions. And when they heard voices, they wouldn't know where it came from because they've got no concept of that other dimension. <clears throat> and so we are in danger of putting all of our children into flatland. And we're also almost there ourselves, because we cannot see a way out of this. We come here, we have these conferences, we have seminars, we write learned articles, we write vituperative articles for the, whoever will publish us, and at the end of it all, we're still trapped inside this two-dimensional world. And we know that imagination, those extra dimensions, imagination, creativity, all of those things are the missing dimensions in our education system. We're finding them as best we can. And it broke my heart today to actually listen to such innovative and creative people who are oppressed uh, by what people like me make them do. And uh, in the sense that ultimately the headmaster and the board of governors or the board of directors, whatever you call us, we will choose uh, the curriculum uh, for the school. So there's an urgent need for us to stop grasping at gimmicks, uh, and to really think deeply and profoundly about what we're doing. Someone I came across recently, um, you're probably thinking at this stage, well, this is some cranky old uh, historian. Uh, but I do have a friend and an ally in this respect, which will bring me to my concluding point, because you're all dying to know which of the dream teachers has won the dream award. Um, but there's someone on my side, a geneticist at Stanford called Professor Jerry Crabtree, and he has a lab named after him. So there you are, impressive credentials. Uh, and he's written the following. 
He said, I would wager that if an average citizen from Athens of 1000 BC were to appear suddenly amongst us, teleported down from the Starship Enterprise, he or she would be among the brightest and most intellectually alive of our colleagues and companions with a good memory, a broad range of ideas, and a clear-sighted view of important issues. Furthermore, I would guess that he or she would be among the most emotionally stable of our friends and colleagues. And I would also make this wager for the ancient inhabitants of Africa, Asia, India, or the Americas of perhaps 2,000 to 6,000 years ago. <clears throat> so I'm building up to a big point in a moment. And what he does is he uses the mathematics of random genetic mutations of the 2,500 or so genes that drive our intellect and shape it. And he does this to show that we probably reached our intellectual peak about two and a half to 3,000 years ago. And it's been downhill ever since. But because we've got some fancy gadgets, we think we're pretty smart. A lot of the evidence is to the contrary. Um, but when you start to think about it, um, the intellectual leap that was made around that time was colossal. We are mere pygmies in comparison to that. People invented writing out of nowhere. They invented speech. Picasso went to the caves of Lascaux, one of the greatest artists who's ever lived, and he looked at what people had done 12,000 years ago. He said he was wrong, it was 30,000 years ago. And he said, we have learned nothing in 12,000 years. He looked at the art there and said, this is astonishing. Now, he was a man who was known to hate everyone who was as good as him or better than him, and he admired uh, these people. You go to the temple of Karnak today, the paint is still fresh after 4,000 years. How did they do that? The paint on everything I have fades in about three days. And if you look at the mathematics involved, someone had to start mathematical reasoning out of nowhere, and it came from that sort of era that uh, Professor Crabtree is talking about. Now, Professor Crabtree, and probably me, uh, has been roundly dismissed and thoroughly abused, and perhaps he deserves it. But it certainly made me think about where we are at the moment, and perhaps there's something in that. Because human beings invented images. We didn't think in images. We didn't, we didn't know how to create images uh, once upon a time. Um, we didn't have alphabets. We didn't have all of that astonishing intellectual achievement of that time. We talk about the Socratic questioning and method. For God's sake, the man invented it two and a half thousand years ago, and we're still behind the curve. There are very few schools in the world which are actually using that as a fundamental tool. Euclid, Pythag the Pythagorean theorem, whoever actually invented that, it was known in India, ancient Babylonia, and the Mediterranean world. It still stands after all those thousands of years. If you look at leadership, ethics, and altruism, Ashoka had it all worked out, his rock and pillar edicts, and he carved them on rock, so you can still read them in 2013. And all you need to know about leadership and running a country is in there, in those, I'm not going to beat you with these or read them out to you, but you don't need anything else. He had it worked out, and we've been ignoring him for two and a half thousand years. The Bhagavad Gita, chapter 16, verse 3, everything you need to know about a good education, it's all there, written thousands of years ago, and we're still ignoring a large part of it. So am I against, just to conclude, am I against progress, technology, innovation, globalization, and so on and so forth? Is this about going back to the future, some sort of nostalgia for a golden age, um, which is long past? Um, it's not really, no. I mean, what I'm looking for is an Arab spring of the intellect, what I'm looking for, because we, are, we need it so desperately, is we are up against it. The clock is running down on us. The human have, people talk about saving the planet. The planet doesn't care whether you and I are alive or dead, but I care about the human habitat and whether my great-grandchildren will be able to breathe. 
So we are really up against it. And we need an intellectual revolution, which is going to be the equivalent, because of the scale of the problems which the, these young people are worried about, we're going to need an intellectual revolution on the scale of that which happened about 3,000 years ago. Paradigm shift in our thinking. I saw a picture of an Aboriginal man, and he was looking out over an Australian landscape. Just remember that that intellectual revolution came out of that sort of view. He was sitting on a rock looking at the world. Then what happened? We built amphitheaters. And after amphitheaters in the ancient world, the Romans put, started putting roofs on them to shelter themselves from the, the sun and the rain. And then we went to theaters. And then someone invented film. We had big theaters with big screens. Then the multiplex. Then we started viewing the world through a television screen. OK, they're quite big. Then we went to a desktop. Then we went to a laptop. Then we went to a tablet. And now we are viewing the world through this and walking around. And it's no wonder we trip up. And when I'm on this thing, I feel like those trained chimpanzees who are put in the Mercury space capsules, capsule, who are trained by operant conditions. I sit there, this thing, down, down. So from seeing the world and the greatest intellectual development in, in 300,000 years happened with people looking at the world that way, and we're viewing the world through something this, this big. Um, <clears throat> if I were a lawyer, I'd say, your honor, I rest my case. <clears throat> but I'm looking for a, a revolution, and it's going to need a political revolution. And if, th if there's anyone from the police service, I believe there's someone from the prime minister's office here, but hey, you know, I've had a good life thus far, so. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but um, we need an Arab spring of the intellect. <clears throat> we need to rise up and stop this. When I was in Egypt, um, I painted two paintings. I don't claim to have talent, but I do have industry. And I painted a picture in 2000, which was really a critique of rampant consumer capital. And in the background were the Twin Towers in New York, which I saw as a symbol of finance capitalism at its most rampant. A year later, boom, some paradigm thinkers put a couple of jets in there, terrible atrocity. Um, <clears throat> Then two years later, I painted a picture which I called the fruit cellar, showing central Cairo in flames. And a fruit cellar, very patient. It's a semi-abstract painting <coughs> and waiting. Because at that time, I thought this is going to implode and it's going to um, uh, turn into something extremely nasty. Um, <coughs> two years later, the Kafaya movement came in. Kafaya meant enough. And now we see what happened. And incredibly, it was all triggered by a fruit seller in Tunisia who burnt himself to death in the capital, uh, uh, Tunis. So these are paintings which are actually hanging on my wall. They sound terrible. Actually, they're not bad, but uh, you won't want to buy them. Um, and people have said to me when I've said that, is they well, don't, don't paint anything about India. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, for, the, for the time I've been here, I haven't done anything. But I feel a painting coming on. It's much more complex. Mubarak was a sort of single, easy to sort of think about figure. Um, and the Twin Towers represented something that's right. So India is a lot more complex. But a painting is coming on. And I just conclude. And I'm going to honor the ladies by changing man to woman. Because there weren't any guys here except for me. Um, um, and uh, jo George Bernard Shaw, in his Maxims for Revolutionists, said, uh, the reasonable man, which I now changed to woman, uh, the reasonable woman adapts herself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to herself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable woman. That's using logic, <clears throat> which was part of that in intellectual revolution. So I am enjoining you uh, to be unreasonable. It's time for us to scream enough and to start getting a little unreasonable when it comes to leadership, ethics, altruism, 
and everything that goes with it. I think the votes are counted. So on cue, I shall say thank you and good night. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for sharing your inspiring educational perspective with us. We now present a token of our gratitude. <laughs>